You've likely heard the phrase, every man for himself. And how about this one? Do what you got to do to get to the top. But God's definition of success comes another way, a surprisingly different way. Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, we'll hear Dr. J. Vernon McGee's explanation of this great reversal as we study one of the most magnificent passages about Jesus Christ, and it's found in Philippians 2. I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus for another great adventure in God's Word. And while you find your seat, let's welcome Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, who's here with a few great letters from our mailbag. And we really do love your letters so much. We do, and it is such an honor that you share your story with us. And we were talking about this earlier this month, but I, I want to challenge everybody listening to these stories. Don't just hear them, but think about, is there anything in my life that my brother or my sister in Christ is challenging me to? Yes. I find some of these responses very challenging uh, in, in a good way, not a yes. guilt-inducing way, yes. but an inspirational way. So you want to start with this letter from Bill? Yep, absolutely. Bill in Virginia, thank you for the Bible bus passes. I've handed out a few and keep them on hand, reminding me to pray and share them anywhere the Holy Spirit guides. Admittedly, I'm seeing how my habits and ways have been too self-focused, and these cards and the World Prayer Team is helping me to throw off my old self and strive to live in and follow the Spirit. God is so good, patient and full of mercy and grace, worthy of all praise. These passes help. I'll work at getting them out all around my sphere of influence. May God continue to bless you as the whole word gets it's out to the whole world. And there's an example. I mean, Bill is an example to us. He's not saying, oh, I'm perfect and I do this right. He's saying, I'm trying to grow in this area. And I love the challenge of, yeah, how can I grow in my walk with Jesus? And how can a tool like the Bible Bus Pass help? Now let's go to Susan in Florida. And I like I like a letter that begins like this. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Today's World Prayer Team email is a message straight from the Lord to me. Right. I praise him for Paloma sharing her testimony and her witness to us. Like her, I have struggled my entire life with envy. I've always wanted what other people had. I'm ashamed to admit this. But I now want what Paloma has. I want to be grateful. I want the kindness of our Lord Jesus. I want his gentleness. I want true joy over the successes and the gifts others have. I want to be where Jesus wants me to be on the inside and out. So many times the testimonies of these dear brothers and sisters totally blow my mind and speak to my soul. Thank you for inviting me to pray. And in this way, I too can share in getting the word out. Wow, that is <laughs> my, so exciting. My. You know, if you would like to be encouraged and challenged by yeah. what other people are having uh, happen and how the Lord is impacting them around the world, you need to join our world prayer team. It's super easy. Go to ttb.org forward slash pray. Sign up. You'll get that daily email Monday through Friday. Quickly read the testimony, be encouraged and challenged, and then pray. It will change your focus in so many different ways. Absolutely. And just a, a reminder for our newer listeners, we don't beg people for money. All we'll ever do is ask you to pray. So that's an important thing that you need to know when you give us your, your email address. Yeah, I think we got time for one more. Yes. Here's, here's Terry in Texas. Hello, I've listened for a while now, on and off for years. The teaching has made such a difference in my life. Growing up without spiritual guidance, I got saved, but only really started to grow as I read the Word of God. Listening to Dr. McGee is like having a friend walk you through something that could be confusing, but they help you see more clearly. Today's message helped me see the beauty of King David's love and dependence upon God. I desire to love God with my whole heart, too. Thank you for keeping the Bible bus going. Fantastic. So encouraging that God is at work in the lives and hearts of our listeners. Yeah. Greg, would you pray for our study in Philippians and then also for our listeners here at home and around the world? Father, when we hear what you're doing in people's lives, we are inspired and encouraged that those things can happen in our lives too. And thank you for that. Thank you for the way we minister to each other in this family called Through the Bible. And we do pray for our study in Philippians to work deeply into our hearts and lives so that it becomes real for us. And we pray that same prayer in all the hundreds of languages that are being taught around the world. We praise you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's study Philippians 2 now on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now back we come today to Philippians, the second chapter. And we're putting in today at verse 5 again. That's where we left off. 
It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, what kind of mind was that? Well, we are going to see now in the seven steps of his humiliation. And he came down and down and down to this earth, all the way to where we are. And you and I today can't even conceive of what a big step it was from heaven's glory all the way down to this earth. Absolutely, it's beyond human comprehension to understand what our Lord really did for us. A friend of mine, we were standing the other day at the Polly as you cross over from Honolulu proper to the windward side of the island, you go across what they call the Polly. Well, it is really pretty high cliffs. I don't know how high they are. Several hundred feet, just a sheer drop-off. friend of mine was saying, because we were standing there looking, there was a golf club down below, and he said, my, I'd like to go down there and play golf. And another friend standing there, he said, you know, he said, it's not far down there from here, but that first step is a long one. Well, that first step would be a long one, several hundred feet down. And I don't think you'd be able to play much golf. But our Lord came out of heaven's glory all the way down, as we shall see in these seven steps downward. Now, in verse 6, it says, this is step number one, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, here was the thing that I attempted to just briefly go over last time, and I'd like to pick up right there, that what it really means here, that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, it wasn't something that he was hanging on to. There was no danger of him losing his place and position in the Godhead because of any lack on his part or the ability and ambition of a contender. He was God without any effort at all. And he didn't come down reluctantly like this. Oh, I, I hate to leave heaven. Oh, I don't want to go down on that trip. Oh, that's something I don't want to do. It's not something, see, he held on to. He came down joyfully. And there was no danger of him losing his position or him not being God. He didn't say, and I want to be very careful now, I'm not being irreverent when I say this. He didn't whisper into the ear of God the Father and say, now look, will you be sure and keep my place here right by the side of you and keep a sharp eye out for Gabriel? I think he's after my place. And while I'm gone, for 33 years, he might be able to get my place, and therefore I'm reluctant to go. My friend, he didn't come down like that. There was no danger of him losing anything. He joyfully, it was for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He came all the way down, and he wasn't holding on to it. It wasn't something forced upon him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it was a gift. And a gift is not something that's forced. If it is, it's not a gift. And he came willingly. If he hadn't come willingly, it would not have been a sacrifice. You see it all. And therefore, he came joyfully to this earth. Now, he left the glory of heaven, and he came down to this earth. And it says here, in verse 7, the second step, but made himself of no reputation. Now, if you'll notice here, a better translation of that, the word here, is, and this is where the kenosis theory comes from, is the word kenao, and it means he emptied himself. Now, there's always been a question, what did he empty himself of? And there were those some of the first heresies had to do that he emptied himself of his deity. That when he came down, the deity came on to him at his baptism and left him at the cross. Well, this makes it very clear here that he emptied himself of something, but he did not empty himself of his deity. 
He was 100% God when he was a little baby reclining in a helpless position on the bosom of Mary. He was then a little helpless baby. But at that moment, he could have spoken this universe out of existence. Why? Because he's God. And he was 100% God, not 99 and 44 one hundredths percent, but 100%. There never was a moment when he was not God, when he came down yonder to Bethlehem. Now we are told here that he emptied himself. Now what did he empty himself of? And I'm convinced he emptied himself of something. Well, I think he emptied himself of the prerogatives of deity. Now, when he came down to Bethlehem at Christmas time, we make a great deal of the fact that there were the shepherds and the wise men. Of course, they didn't get there a couple years later, but that doesn't seem to bother the Christmas pageants that we have. And there was the angel, Gabriel, and there were the heavenly hosts. And my, we think that's just great. Well, friends, I must say, I disagree with that. He's God. Did you know that instead of a few angels, instead of a few shepherds being there, did you know the whole universe should have been there? Every created creature should have been there because they're going to all bow to him someday. They should have been there. Caesar should have been there. The whole Roman Empire should have been there. Religion should have been there. The temple in Jerusalem should have been empty that day, and they should have come down to Bethlehem because he was born there, but they didn't. And why didn't he force it? Well, he laid aside his prerogatives of deity. He didn't force anything. He was willing to go into that stable there, and we always make it in the Christmas pageants a pretty clean stable. Well, it wasn't. It was a dirty, filthy place. And somebody says, well, it was the same place that the people slept. Well, they were in the adjoining building, I'm sure, but the thing is, it was not very clean where all these animals were. And that's where he was born. And he went up there to Nazareth, a little old miserable town, and he was raised there, and he was a carpenter, unknown, unheard of, and yet, probably, more people have heard of him up to today than any other person except Abraham. He has been a world figure, and he was brought up in that little carpenter shop up there, and he laid aside his prerogatives of deity. He could have had the kind of glory with him all the time, but he didn't. They always paint him, you know, with a picture with a halo around his head. He didn't have a halo around his head. Judas, even the night he was arrested, had to come and kiss him so that the soldiers would know who he was. He didn't stand out like that from the others. My friend, this idea today that he went around with a halo and his head in the clouds and looking up all the time, it was a big mistake. He was a human being. He had taken upon himself that. But he was God manifest in the flesh. And he laid aside those prerogatives. Now, somebody says to me, can you be sure of that? I think I can. Now, when he had finished his ministry, and you remember he was gathered with his own that last night. And in that prayer that last night, he prayed a very wonderful prayer. It is the Lord's Prayer. It's in John 17. Will you listen to him? One thing he said in that prayer was this. Verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee from before the world was. Now, you notice that? He says, I want the glory that I had. I want that now restored to me. Apparently, he laid aside his prerogatives of deity, the glory light, and it broke out on several occasions, as you know, and certainly after his resurrection, it was there. But now, he says, as he's going to return to heaven, restore to me the glory that I had with thee. Obviously, he laid that aside, you see. So, he didn't lay aside his deity. He's God of very God, and he's man of very man. 
The oldest creed of the church says that, and my friend, that's the way it's been down through the ages, and the thinking of men today can't change that one whit. Who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Now, the third step down. And he took upon him the form of a servant. Now, he came to this earth as a servant. He was a carpenter. I suppose that you lived in Nazareth in that day. You could have gone by and said to him, Jesus, I have some repair work to be done at my house. Doors coming off the hinges. I wonder if you'd come fix it. I think he would have said, I'll be right over. You see, he took upon himself the form of a servant. He could have been born in Caesar's palace. He was a king, but he never made that claim during those early years. Never made it till he rode into Jerusalem in the so-called triumphal entry. But up to that time, why, he took upon him the form of a servant. That's the way he came into this world. You talk about the working man today, the humble man, the little man. That's the way he came into this world. He came not only as a human being, but he came among the majority, where most of us are today, little people. And that's the way he came into this world. He took upon him the form of a servant. Now, notice the fourth step downward. He was made in the likeness of man. Now, friends, that for years did not impress me at all, because very candidly, I'm a man, and I like being a man. I think there's a dignity about being a human being that's quite wonderful, to be in the likeness of a man. And how can that be humbling? Well, it's very difficult for me today to make it clear to you that the one who's Lord of this universe and the creator of this universe and the one who created man, may I say to you, it was humbling for him to take upon himself the form of a man, to be made in the likeness of man. He was a man down here. He came down not only to redeem mankind, but to reveal God to mankind. How important that was, because how do we know about God? We don't know a thing unless what he tells us. And when he came down to this earth and became a man, we found out a whole lot about God. And that, the only way you can know God is through Jesus Christ, who is God. But he became a man, like the little girl. She went upstairs. Her mother told her to go upstairs and go to bed. And she went upstairs and went to bed and turned out the light. And she began to cry and whimper. And her mother said, what's the matter? She says, I want somebody to come up here and be with me. I don't want to be by myself. And the mother said, God's up there with you. And for a moment, it was quiet. And then she said, but mama, I want somebody with a face. Well, may I say to you, Jesus Christ is God with a face. And he said this concerning himself. He said, I am the water of life. I'm the bread of life. Well, I know about bread and I know about water. And I know about him now. He says, I'm the door. He not only fixed doors, he was the door. And I know about doors. I got doors in my house. You know about doors. He says, I'm the true vine. I know a whole lot about vines out here in California. And I know something else. He says, I am the life and I'm the way. My, these words, they tell us a great deal about him and about who he is. He came to reveal God. But notice what it says here. He took upon himself the likeness of man. Now, I say it again, I like being a man. And I can't see that that's being humbling to become a man. It was for him to leave heaven's glory and become a man. Let me give you a very homely illustration that I trust might be helpful in understanding this. And it's a rather ridiculous one, too but it'll illustrate what we're after. Here in California, the ants are not killed off during the winter time. 
fact of the matter is, it doesn't get that cold. And they may not move about as they did before, but they're still with us. And I didn't know that when we first came to California. It was November. I thought we were through with ants. There wouldn't be any about. And I got up one morning, went into the kitchen. Well, they had opened up one of the first freeways in Southern California to the Sugar Bowl. They were coming down on one side and going back on the other. And I guess they would have taken off all of the sugar. We let them alone. But I got busy and got rid of those ants. And then I found out that they not only made that freeway to the sugar bowl, they made it to the sink because they like water to drink too. And my friend, I want to tell you, I had ant trouble, so I began to find out. Well, I'll tell you what we do. I have a very wonderful friend here in Southern California who's in the business killing bugs. He's a bug exterminator. And about once or twice a year, he comes to my place and he sprays all over the place. And I haven't seen an ant around my place in years. Now, I have a notion that down in the ant world that they've had several protest meetings about me. They say, that fellow lives up in that house. He just doesn't like us, and we don't like the way he does. He's infringing on our liberty. He's destroying us, and they may be marching up and down with a bunch of placards in front of my place right now. I don't know. I haven't noticed, but they may be. And I'm sure they don't have very much use for me because I've really killed them all. No question about that. Now, may I say to you, I really don't hate ants. That's not my hang-up. That's not my problem at all. I just soon let ants live. Now, if I had some way of communicating with those ants and would be able to say to them, look, ants, you stay outside of the house. Just let the sugar bowl alone, stay away from the sink. And I'll put sugar outside for you and water outside. I'd go that far. I'd be willing to do that for them because I don't hate ants, really. But they don't know that. Now, suppose I could get the message to them. How would I do it? Well, suppose that I could go down and become an ant, become one of them, and communicate to them in ant language and get the word through to them. Now, if I could, I want you to know this, I wouldn't. You know why? Because I know some folk today that if I became an ant, they'd step on me, and I'm not going to become an ant, not going to take that chance. But suppose I could go down there and become an ant and communicate. My friend, that to me would be humbling. May I say to you that for me to go down and become an ant is nothing compared to what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he left heaven's glory and came down to this earth and became a man. It was humbling for him to become a man. And he was made in the likeness of man. How tremendous that is. He became one of us. And it was humbling for him to do that. Now, there's another step here. And that is the fifth step. And it says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Now, the fact of the matter is, he wasn't humbled by someone else. Now, many of us, I'm sure, have been humiliated by someone else saying or doing something. But he wasn't humbled like that. He humbled himself. That's the most difficult thing in the world to do. One of the finest things I ever heard about John Wesley was this. One time, he was going to cross a stream, just a brook. And there was a narrow board across. And as he went over, he met a liberal preacher of that day. And there were in that day, of course. And this liberal preacher swelled up and he says, I never give way to a fool. John Wesley looked at him for a moment and smiled and began to back off. And John Wesley said, I always do. <laughs> May I say to you, it's difficult to take that humble place. But that's always made me think a great deal of John Wesley. It's difficult to humble ourselves. Well, our Lord did that, and he became obedient unto death and the death of the cross. We'll see that next time. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
Check out our many Bible study resources at ttb.org. Or if we can help you find something specific, just call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Again, that's ttb.org or 1-800-65-BIBLE. Or you can always email us at biblebus at ttb.org. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'll be here next time, saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?